Hello, hello, and welcome to Lawrence Plays for the second part of the update video from the last stream, where, well, we've, um, we've managed to finally get a decent amount of power available for the Stargate, and so we're going to find out what happens. Now, as before, with anything involving the Stargate, there's going to be some potential spoilers in this first part of the video, so um, if, you want to, if you want to avoid the spoilers, well, I'll stick a timestamp on screen now, and you can just skip forward a chapter or two to where I'll just be talking about the normal builds and so on that go on in a Factorio run. In the last stream, Mark did some more expansion of the power systems out here in Fenestra. So he's, we've got, again, we've got the spaceship here that's bringing out all of the matter that we need in order to keep the uh, reactors powered. And then he's added in a lot more Singularity reactors down here. As you can see, we've now got a huge number of them. This probably fills up all the blueprints we were looking at last time. And that allows us to now produce 106 gigawatts. So, fingers crossed, this is actually going to be enough to power the Stargate and set all of the nodes on it. So, let's give this a try. I haven't actually played with this yet in the stream because this was only just finished at the end of the stream when we're about ready to stop. However, each t we've, we've learned from, the, from before that each time you turn on one of these movable components or just the, uh, the power platform at the bottom here, it takes an extra 10 gigawatts. So we're, we're hoping that 106 gigawatts is going to be enough to power the whole thing up. Now, at this stage, I don't. we haven't solved the puzzle involving all of the, uh, the uh, glyphs that go around the edge of here, so, so I'm just going to load random ones into all of the slots around the edge. So let's just, let's just go along here like this and grab whatever happens to be underneath them, because I'm curious to see what the Stargate does when you finally turn it on. So we go, pushed all those across now, and they've all got things now. However, nothing has happened, and I suspect that this is because down here we haven't fi finished uh, lighting up all of the anchor points on here. So this means the Stargate is still just sort of vaguely drifting in space and doesn't really know what's going on. However, if we look over here, we can see that we are now using 90 gigawatts, so that's as expected. That's 10 gigawatts for every single one of the eight things around the outside, and then another 10 for the uh, power platform at the bottom. So that at least has gone as we expected. But at this point, we don't seem to be able to turn it on, and I believe, well, at least the next thing I want us to fix to find out why is the number of anchor points down here. So you can see that we've got, well, the, all of these things have been, have been set. And maybe if I poke one of these again, we can, yes, there we go. We can, you can see it, it went yellow there for a moment. Oh, and it's gone back to green again. But I can rotate it and then put a different one in like that. Is that unset it or unset it? That seems to have unset it. Oh, there we go. So one of them's gone back to red again now. So you can see here that these target symbols get across the bottom. Each one of those will go green when you set one of the movable components around the edge to program in a glyph. We've worked out that the uh, the thermometer seem to go up, go green when you pump in a load of uh, super chilled thermofluid, and the anchors they go green when you place down dimensional anchors and power them. And we started off with a first dimensional anchor here in in Kalidus orbit, where we've got well we've got quite a lot of power out here, and a lot of that is going straight into the dimensional anchor because these things are very very hungry. You can see that's taking 60 gigawatts, and that's m almost twice the amount of power that's being taken by all of these um, beam power emitters across here. Uh, so yeah, that. That's rather a lot. These these are kind of kind of hungry, and that's why we have such a big solar field here. And this refers back to what I was saying in the last video about how there weren't any of these uh, red solar panels available for me to grab for uh, use out with on Talos because Mark had been taking them all in order to use them for make, putting these anchors down. Now this one has been here for a while, but Mark says he's put down another one, and I believe that's quite a long way down here in Asimius orbit. So if we have a look at here and here, we can view the surface, and there we go. Yes, there's another dimensional anchor. So we have two of these in place now, and one. Once again, we have a huge solar field because we need that 60 gigawatts and he's produced 66.1. So we've got a little bit of spare over here. That's fine. I guess some of that's to run these guns and some of it is just maybe to make it into a nice neat square. Who knows? But so that means we've got a second dimensional anchor over here. And we're sort of assuming that each one of these has to go into orbit around a star and has to be in orbit around a different star. So we probably can't just go over to Kalidus orbit and drop all six of them or eight of them or however many we need in in a row. Uh, and it's, this is a difficult thing to test because you need to put down an enormous enormous amount of power, of solid power, or at least some form of power generation, in order to actually test anything with these things. So we're, we're, we're playing it cautiously, and we're going off and using them as, as sensibly as we can. But looking at the description of the dimensional anchor, it says it uses a star's gravity well, so that suggests it probably needs to be vaguely close to the star, and if you're going to be putting one of these things in near, near a star, then you might as well put it in in orbit around that star, because that way you get more power from, the, uh, from the, your solar panel. So when you're in orbit around a, a star, you get about 1500% boost on your solar, or effectiveness of your solar, compared to if, if you're out on, at least if you're on Norvis. And the further out you go from the star, the lower that goes. So if we try to put one in around Picard for some strange reason, you see we're only getting 7% out here. So we'd need an 
absolutely phenomenal number of solar panels to produce that 60 gigawatts we need. And so even if they don't have to go in orbit around a star, you might as well put them there because that's going to make it much, much easier. It's going to require a lot fewer solar panels. And so these, those two anchors have brought us up to two green lights on the uh, on the Stargate over here, and that's a good start. We need another, we do need another six out there somewhere, so that's going to be quite a big job. And once that's been done, we can then test this thing a little bit more thoroughly. Maybe just put in random sigils again and see what we get in the middle. I mean, I'm expecting it to do a sort of a wibbly thing like in the uh, Stargate TV series and movies, or some sort of vague approximation of that. However, until we get the, work out what the correct glyphs are to put in all the way around the outside, I'm not expecting it to do anything particularly useful. I think we should probably turn this off again because that's a lot of power for it to be running through and okay it doesn't matter technically because I'm going to I'm not going to save at the end of this and so on and so on but even so you can see down here how we've now got an extra large number of these uh, empty singularity fuel cells coming out because this is because all of these reactors down here have suddenly needed to produce huge amounts of power so they've gone down from having five in their buffers they've all used at least one up maybe two all of those have gone into here and they're now waiting to be refilled with matter and that's what this machine here is doing and it's going to take a while because there's a lot of them and it's a fairly slow process. However, as long as we don't go turning the Stargate on too often, we should be able to keep up reasonably easily and it shouldn't really matter. Uh, the matter supply over here, pun actually unintentional believe it or not, um, seems to be keeping up reasonably well. We've ripped through maybe half of it, um, a bit less than half of what was, uh, what was originally here. I think this is going to be well, actually, I don't know if this is going to be okay to refill all these canisters, but we can always go back to uh, Norbis and get some more matter if we need it. As far as actually solving the puzzle goes, we, we've made a little bit of progress. Uh, we've done one more long-range star mapping research, which means we've now found this extra symbol at the bottom, this, um, this yen symbol almost. It's not quite a yen, is it? I'm not, I'm not quite sure how best to describe that. So we found another one. We found some more coordinates in here. We've not done any real thinking about how to put these together and what it all means, but we've at least, we're at least sort of gathering extra data to play with. Mike wasn't with us this week because he was off gallivanting around, around the country or having a holiday or something like that. He wasn't available anyway, which is absolutely disgraceful. Uh, so in his absence, Tristan went out and did a load more, uh, a load more exploring of various pyramids, and he's now picked up another 14 of them uh, from I'm not sure exactly sure where. I think he said he went, he sort of swept around the right hand side of the uh, of the map over here. So he's gone out, he's, he's done a load more of the uh, a load more pyramids in these various star systems, and uh, and come back with a load of tier nine uh, modules, quite a lot of speed and productivity ones, which is good, and also uh, the odd efficiency one, which are they're they're less useful, should we say? The useful modules will be finding their ways into the labs and the and the uh, beacon for the lab at uh, reasonably soon, and we'll then we'll, get, we'll be able to get these running even better, even higher productivity levels. As you can see at the moment, we're getting a plus 169 percent. I think that's the same as last time. So presumably that means Tristan hasn't actually managed to make it back to Norvis yet and, and put the modules where they belong. But they'll get there sooner or later. I haven't actually updated the diagram I showed you last time to put the extra uh, ca extra cartouches on that we found. However, Tristan informs me that we've now got to the point where. Two of the cartouches have nine out of 11 of the glyphs around the outside explored. And so that means we're now starting to get quite good ideas of how a lot of the, um, how a lot of the glyphs sort of fit together. And so far it does seem to be more or less following the theory we had before, that they are the surface of a sphere. And so when we try and turn them into a flat map like we were doing before, it's going to be a bit stretched, especially around the top and bottom, uh, like a Mercator projection uh, map would be. But also the symbols and the coordinates we're finding from the long range star mapping do seem to come together quite nicely to suggest that those glyphs are in those particular directions. Again, not quite sure how useful that's going to be with solving the actual puzzle, but at some point we're going to take a look at the coordinates we found in the exploration journal in the uh, ship log down here, and try and maybe try and put some of the numbers like this together and, and, and see if we can see if we can add up various vectors to get these vectors or possibly the opposite of those vectors, feed that into the Stargate and just, you know, and see what happens. Uh, at this point we're quite happy to, to, uh, to experiment a little bit. However, we're still going to need that horrendous quantity of um, solar power and scaffolding and and through from those also some anchors uh, and in order to make all of that an enormous quantity of low density structures so that's that's still some way off on a loosely related note I started having a look at the uh, triangle glyphs that are on the bottom part of the cartouches and these seem to sort of fit together in a kind of in a kind of jigsaw puzzle kind of way so I've been putting them together they might be forming a triangle it's kind of hard to tell at this stage but I did notice that there seem to be at least two copies of every of most of the uh, most of the glyphs 
So if you're looking at these two, for example, you can see that if I rotate the one on the right, it's then identical to the one on the left. The two match perfectly. And so I'm wondering if you could build a sort of a north facing one and a south facing one. And that's why some of the triangles point up and some point down. Or if there's just some sort of funny business going on here. I also noticed that these two are, well, if you rotate one of them, then they're mirrored. So they're not, it's not even a rotational thing. So maybe there's a sort of an, an up, a down, and, a sort of, and then mirrors of both of those. It's all a bit weird, but I guess if there's too many pyramids and therefore too many glyph sets for the, uh, for, the, for the shape that's made, then you might as well have some spare extra ones like that. I don't know. Uh, again, once again, I'm not sure there's enough information to really draw any useful conclusions from this, but I, but I thought I'd play around with them a little bit and get an idea of what was going on and see what it looked like. Tristan also picked up some extra Arcospheres while he was out, so he was very busy in the last stream. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm quite impressed how much he got done. But he went out to Star Corpse and got seven. That's a lovely name. Shattered Skies for six. Realm of Shadows for seven. Realm of Shadows sounds familiar. I think that was where I went for my um, all of my Naquium mining in my last run. And also to Sky Fragments for another six. So now we have a total of... 224 Arcospheres from all the places we've been out to. So that's that's quite impressive. That's a good number of them. We, we seem to have a, an, a nice healthy supply of those. And that should be enough to keep the uh, the system up here running nicely, even after I come over and steal 20 lambdas out of it to go off and make my ArcoLink storage chests for, uh, for, the, for extra Naquium. Getting these anchor systems set up is incredibly expensive. As I sort of touched on earlier, I was saying it requires an enormous number of solar panels. Out on this ship, the Nexus, Mark has been collecting all the bits and pieces he's going to need for these uh, deployments. So he's got a huge number of solar panels gradually coming over and filling up these chests. Um, these are actually all full. They seem to fill up, yeah, fill up to 960 each. And then he's also gathering huge amounts of space scaffolding as well. And that we seem to have a bit of a shortage of. Interestingly, we don't seem to have a shortage of the red solar panels anymore, which is quite nice. Presumably that means that down here we've finally managed to make enough of them to keep that satisfied and to have a few more left over. And yes, you can see that all these machines have stopped. We've got red chests along here that are now nice and full. I suspect it may have been the Holmium cable we're short of because that was, has been a problem for quite a while. And we've also got these advanced, the purple solar panels. These took quite a lot of making and we've done a bit of upgrading of that over, this, uh, over the last couple of series. And also down here, yeah, we also need beryllium scaffolds and those have been in short supply as well at various points. And so um, now that I've fixed the beryllium supply, hope, hope Hopefully. Hopefully this will now mean we have enough beryllium scaffolds coming in here to make all of these solar panels we require. And at the moment, as I say, it looks very promising. The uh, This machine, oh, I was going to say this machine is running happily, but no, it's run out of the, uh, the blue solar panels uh, because we've run out of the uh, multispectral mirrors. Those are being made a short way off to the north up here. Uh, and what are we short of here? We're short of low density structures. So that's another problem that's related to the, uh, the beryllium because on down on Norvis, the low density structures are being made over here in the beryllium area and we've clearly run out of something. And we've run out of aeroframe scaffolds because down here we've run out of, um, oh, we've run out of cryonite. That's an odd one to run out of. Over here in the uh, trains from space area, we have a train that is uh, about a quarter full, okay, and a warehouse that is emptied. Back up in Norbit, we have a huge amount of cryonite and a train that isn't doing anything. So there's something something has gone wrong with the logistics here. This train is supposed to wait until it gets a pit, until it gets a signal saying, hey, we need some cryonite somewhere in the factory. And then it's supposed to leave. It's supposed to try and go to cryonite drop. And it seems to be trying to do that at the moment. Ah. I think I know what might be the problem here. In a previous stream, I set up a request up here for cryonite. And um, I think what's probably going on here is yes, we've got we've got a um, we've a set a train limit of zero here instead of enabling or disabling. So what I need to do over here to fix this is to tell this to enable the station when an L signal is greater than zero. Now that train is, is not going to try to go to the cryonite drop station anymore because instead of having just have instead of just having a train limit of zero, which means wait until you can go to that station, it now is disabled or deactivated, meaning that the train will skip over that station. And that means because we still have that ping saying somewhere needs cryonite, the train is going to head over this way and head down to Norvis, where it will drop that cryonite off and it can be taken over to be made into the low density structures. And here it goes down the elevator to pop out at the other end and then it can trundle around here and head up to the uh, the cryonite station that we were, we were looking at a moment ago, which is a little bit of a trek. It can then pull in here and unload all of that cryonite it's brought down with it, which will then filter around and go into the, into the ground train that will take it over to the area where we're going to be trying to make those uh, low density structures. So we need to let a little bit, let, let, let this flow through. Hopefully there'll be enough, uh, there might not be enough in this train to fill up this train, but it sort of, it sort of doesn't matter. We found out why it was broken, why things weren't working. 
So now we can sort of just leave it and it will catch up. So uh, yeah, that was my bad. I set that I set that station up wrongly and didn't realize that I'd broken everything until uh, until just now. So um, sorry about that. Anyway, so once that's running again, we'll start making these mirrors again, which means they'll flow down here. We'll be able to make more of the uh, more of the solar panels. We've actually already got enough of those at the moment, and that'll start working again. Loosely relatedly, in fact, not, not very loosely relatedly, quite accurately, quite closely related, is the problem over here where we have stopped making the space scaffolding, again, because we've run out of low density structures. So that's the same fix to fix both the problems we're seeing here. But then we'll, once that starts running again and everything starts behaving, we'll get a, good, a nice flow of low density structures through here. We'll make lots and lots of scaffolding. That can be taken over to Mark's spaceship up here. We'll load this one up and then he'll be able to go out and make another dimensional anchor. And then we'll have three of them. And then we'll have to make all of that again, so we can go out and do a fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth ones, and then we'll be able to actually turn the Stargate on and see what happens. The next planet to look at is Njord, the Holmium planet. And so Tristan reports that he has, in the last stream, he managed to completely empty the uh, one remaining stone patch on this planet. And he's bring, bring that, bringing that stone over and dropping it off in a station somewhere, probably, probably around here somewhere. Probably this one. No, this is a core, core drop station. Maybe this one? Yes, here we go, stone drop. So the stone's being unloaded here and then taken out along these belts where there's, there's a bit of a tangle, but the, uh, the, the the long and short of it is that the stone will eventually get crushed down and taken away to be made into enormous quantities of hydrogen chloride. Um, and I'm just following these belts around in the hope that I'll find something. Um, I don't, I'm not quite, oh, here we go, here it is down here, yes, of course it is. So over here, he's making the hydrogen chloride, which goes out in this pipe here and comes over to go into the tanks and is used in the Holmium production. And as you can see down here, it's rather short of it, and that's going to be giving us a severe problem with the Holmium production over here. Uh, and so something needs to be done about it. At the moment, the system is running off the stone that comes out from the uh, from core processing, and it doesn't seem to be sufficient. Although there is a very, very slow belt of it coming through here. This is a yellow belt that's trying to feed lots and lots of uh, crushing machines. And yeah, I... I don't know, it doesn't look like there is an actual shortage of stone over here because this belt is completely full. However, this system is not running fast enough. There is, however, another supply of hydrogen chloride being brought in from over here. Presumably this is coming from an old production system that he had before uh, before the last set of upgrades. Uh, yes, this one up here. And this is not getting any stone at the moment. This is getting a nice dribble of sand that's coming through from... I don't know, there's, there's stone coming in from here, I'm not quite sure why. Oh, it's coming out of the core processing, or that core processing. Uh, it's dribbling in here and we're making a very, very small amount of sand to make, and, and making some hydrogen chloride up here, but it's not it's not really sufficient. The problem is, there is not enough stone on this planet, and as I say, Tristan has gone out and dug up all of the stuff that's available out here, and so something is going to need, to need to be done. The obvious answer to this is going to be load an enormous quantity of stone into the spaceship that comes over from Norvis, uh, which he has already started doing by the looks of it. So we've got a lot of stone in here. It's trying to make its way through the uh, through the belt system down here. I think this is probably a work in progress. It's kind of hard to tell. I can see that he's trying to put in some extra belts around the bottom here. Um, and maybe he's going to try and load the train up a bit more quickly with them. It's, it, it, it's hard to tell. There's, as I say, there's clearly some building work going on down here. Oh, no, but what's probably happening is he's going to bring the uh, the train batteries around here. And then he's going to have a bit more space available down here to get a few more belts worth of uh, stone to flow through. And load up this train a bit more quickly so it can, uh, it can take a lot more stone down. And that means when it comes down to the planet then, it can unload all of that stone as well into this warehouse. The stone can be passed along this filter belt here, go into this warehouse and... Well, presumably he's going to be coming through here and, and, and doing some more, putting some more belts in to get send the uh, stone off to a few more, uh, a few more areas where he's going to be making the hydrogen chloride. Or perhaps he's just going to upgrade this and make another, a third and a fourth and a fifth and a sixth copies of it down here to make this whole system run a bit quicker. I don't know, but I can tell that it's not finished. It's a work in progress and it ain't working yet. At the moment, we are rather starved for the Holmium. And you can see some quite interesting shapes on the uh, production graph over here. We've got presumably that's a, a supply of stone coming from somewhere, maybe a train coming down from space, although that doesn't feel quite right. Uh, and then it sort of falls off like this until another supply is made available and then falls off again. I'm, this is a funny shape. I wouldn't like to say exactly what's causing this because this, this belt does seem to be running perfectly happily, just very, very slowly because it's very, very low uh, tier belts. If we look back over a longer time where you can see a similar sort of, uh, similar sort of spike going up and down and so we, we uh, hopefully are going to have enough holmium to tide us over until more comes in but um, I wouldn't be surprised if we do start to see some issues. That said 
it's a relatively simple problem, so hopefully it won't take him too long to sort that one out. Yes, Tristan says it's not critical because the cores are, the core chunks that are coming in are still being uh, processed as fast as they come in. However, the uh, Holmium processing that comes from mines is, is struggling a bit because we don't have enough sand or stone or whatever it was I was talking about to make all the bits and pieces we need to, to carry on processing it from uh, from the mine supplies, basically. He also confirms that these this extra bit down here is indeed to load the train up a bit faster, so that is as, as I expected. Uh, but he, needs his, he says he needs his ship back in order to build this. And I think it's me who's stolen the ship. I seem to be responsible for a lot of things breaking at the moment. Um, yes, I, I think I borrowed his ship because out in Talorbit I needed to put down enormous quantities of scaffolding and, um, and, and solar panels and there was at least some available in his ship so I borrowed that to steal all of his supplies. Uh, I think he can probably have the ship back now. I'm, I'm not sure where it is at the moment. It is currently in space and it has reached an orbit, so maybe you can land it there and then start to start using it again. I, it looks it certainly looks like I've finished with it. He has also built a second Njord ship, so now he can have what he now he can have two of them flying back and forth at any one time, and that will allow him to bring a lot more stone over. However, the question is, can you fit enough stone in a spaceship to produce enough holmium to send the spaceship back again? Well, holmium and all the byproducts that come out with it. And if if that's not true, then he's either going to have to start dispatching his spaceships part per and when they're only partially filled, or he's going to have to come up with some other alternative solution for this. Because at the moment, the system is designed to fly a ship out from Norbit to Njord or wherever it goes, have it unload everything it's carrying, and then fill itself up completely before it departs. And to have it set off sooner than that would require a complete rethink of how the how the ship launching systems work. But, you know, I mean, we're capable of, do, of redesigning these things on the fly as we need to, so maybe we will. We shall have to see. Some little bits and pieces were done as well. I came through here. This is the uh, the drop-off station for all of the belts that then feed up into the into the train system that takes everything up to Norbit. And so down here, I upgraded a load of these warehouses to blue warehouses. Now you see along here, they're the ones with modules in, the ones and the threes, these are still red warehouses just in case any of those are needed anywhere. So that would allow the construction bots to come over and grab from these ones and take them away, away to wherever they're needed. But all of these ones through here, I've upgraded to blue warehouses. And that means when I remember and, uh, to come through and, and uh, set them, I can tell this one, for example, to re start requesting uh, processed fuel from the logistics system and rocket fuel and so on and so on and so on, all the way across here. And that's going to pull some useful stuff out of the logistics storage and get it back into where it belongs in the actual systems where it's going to be used. I do need to make sure that there aren't any red chests providing any of these things, because if there are, then we'll just end up bringing it all over by bot, and I don't want to do that. We have trains for a reason. I'm also going to need to switch this robot port here over to normal mode in order to get robot coverage of these warehouses down here, and also I'm going to need to put in another one of these about here, presumably, uh, in order to get coverage of these ones, down, these two down here, and so on. So I'll need to come across all of these, set, get, get them all set up, and get them to start requesting what they, everything they need. But as I say, I need to make sure they don't start requesting from from red chests. Back up here in space, we noticed that the uh, the Deep Space Science 1 production was really, really struggling. It was running very slowly. And it, what that turned out not to be due to a shortage of Naquium. If, if you see up here, we actually have a bit at the moment. We'll probably run out before the end of the video, but we at least have some at the moment. And no, it turned out that it was because um, somewhere along here, all of the everything that was coming out on these belts was being put onto the same side of an output belt. I think it was down here. This was just this was feeding down and side loading onto this belt instead of instead of using a, a splitter like this to do it properly. And that meant that over here in the science area, well, we didn't we weren't able to unload down both sides of this belt because one side was jamming up and it was prioritizing the other side. And if you if you watch this belt for a moment, you'll notice that you were getting all of the broken data cards on one side and the junk data cards on the other. And that meant that the system over here one of the was uh, was unable we're unable to unload all the bits and pieces we needed out of the machines that are making the uh, deep space one science because uh, it just couldn't get we couldn't get the junk onto this belt here fast enough and that was causing a massive shortage of these uh, of these science packs so now that's been declogged these are now running at the rate that they uh, they like to run at i don't know why you're not running oh yes i do it's because we've actually got enough at the moment and that's allowing the, the uh, tier twos to be made here and also and so on and so on up to i think it was i saw the tier three or the tier four running a moment ago but we seem to now actually have enough of all of those and if we have a look at the science that we're doing at the moment, yeah, okay, that's using Deep Space 1 and Deep Space 2. That's got quite a lot more expensive, because I'm sure that long-range star mappings used to only use Deep Space 1. Uh, all four of the Astros, sure, but only one of the Deep Spaces. And so that's got a bit harder to do, and so we're now short of the uh, Deep Space 2s. But never mind, I guess. We'll, we'll, we'll try and keep up with it. We'll do, we'll do, our, uh, do our utmost to keep the uh, science running nicely. A couple of weeks ago, after much fiddling, I managed to get the quantum processor production up and running quite nicely. Uh, I'd upgraded the uh, the number, of the, the quantity of the uh, Holmium cables that were being brought in. I'd upgraded the amount of um, 
uh, holmium that was coming in because because I'd upgraded this belt to carry ingots instead of plates and then we we're chopping it into plates on site down here. However, despite that, we still seem to have problems and now it's the holmium that we've got a shortage of. So everything else is available. However, during the last stream, we ran out of blue circuits. So I increased the amount of blue circuits that were being requested and that meant the train came up a bit sooner and then drops a load off and so we've got the blue circuits we need. But now it looks like we have a problem with holmium. Um, I suspect that's because we don't have enough down on the ground. Yeah, we can, well, we can see there's a bit of a shortage of holmium coming along here. However, it hasn't actually run out for loading up the trains yet. So I'm a little bit surprised that we've not had an energy science train come up. I think this, this is this one. Are you just not full and therefore you're not bothering to head up? Yeah, we, we need to order larger quantities of the things we actually get through. So particularly Holmium Ingers and maybe something else as well, I don't know. So we need to bump the numbers up there and get a bit more flowing through. However, we also seem to be rather short of Holmium. So the next time the train comes down and tries to fill up with a load of it, that's probably going to run out as well. But that's related to what I was talking about earlier, saying uh, where Tristan needs a lot more stone over on Njord and needs to finish off the processing system over there so it can, it can churn through it a bit more quickly and reliably. We had an unexpected clog in the space bus, which is uh, not what we want. It turned out that we were requesting perhaps too much heat shield and too much stone to be brought up to here and that meant that this warehouse here was full. We we're also probably cutting up too many steel ingots into steel plates along here as well and so this, and there was rather a lot of that in here and so Tristan did a bit of fiddling with it. I thought he'd unloaded a load of junk from it into another chest around here somewhere but I can't see where that would be so I'm not quite sure. Exactly, I'm not quite sure where that went unless he unless he took it out and has now put it all back in again. That, that seems quite possible. Oh he's pulled out. Ah yes he's pulled out a load of extra rocket fuel here because there was also far too much of that. As you can see we've still got some in here, we've got an entire warehouse of it here and we've got an entire chest of it here and that's just excessive especially as we're not really using rocket fuel on the bus that much. And so clearing all of that out allowed the uh, the system to start flowing again and as you can see we've now got plenty of space in this warehouse. We've rattled it all through and it's meant that all the stuff that was coming in and jamming at the top has now rattled through and gone down to wherever it belonged and the system is running again quite nicely. So this is the problem with this um, with this sort of bus system and, and you, you saw the same sort of problems in the last video out on Talos where we had it jamming up because we couldn't send all of the iron and sulphur down into the into the uh, warehouse that was supposed to be holding it and therefore it wasn't able to pass all of the next things through and the holmium cables were jamming up and it was all a horrible problem and we had the same sort of issue over here as well. Now as you can see we're getting a load more, um, ah, the uh, low density structures are coming through now, excellent, and some heat shield tiles as well. So this will all flow into here, we can start making those um, those scaffolds again as I was talking about earlier. But yes, yeah, sorting out the uh, sorting out the fuel problem over here did mean that we could then have everything pass through, it unjammed the whole system and now things are working nicely. It also turns out that for some reason the inserters down here that are inserting construction bots and logistics bots into the robo network for Norbit were both running off the same signal. So we're only putting logistics bots into the system if we're short of construction bots. And we're only putting construction bots in if we're short of construction bots. So again, Tristan's fixed that. So we're now, we're now watching for a shortage of, of logistics bots. And then we'll load the logistics bots into the system. So we should always be able to keep a decent number of them there. And as you can see, we now have, well, we have 1,800 of them. And 1,700 of them are available at the moment. And all 4,460 of our construction bots are currently available. So it seems to be working. I'm uh, not going to complain. Tristan has improved the rate that scrap is being churned through or is being chucked out into the processing facility here. So previously I imagine the uh, this, this this splitter here and this underground weren't, weren't there. So we're only sending it through at a space belts rate, uh, at the white belts, the 45 per second belts and now that's been upgraded so we can now get a full 90 a second through because we've got two, two 45 per second going, through, going here and then merging them with this splitter here. And so that means we can get a lot more through and process it down a bit more quickly with all of the machines across here. Uh, that said, as of right now, we ha we are processing it significantly faster, or rather we are able to process it significantly faster than it's coming in. So I guess the uh, material science isn't doing anything at the moment. <laughs> Maybe the matter science as well. And so, uh, yeah, the system is now is currently absolutely fine, but we have the potential to, uh, to run it a lot faster if we need to in the future. And finally, Tristan has set up an additional two stations here over in the matter processing area. And these are set up to call for stone or iron ore, or both, um, from Andrigan and from Oliran, if there's plenty of that available. And if so, it'll, call, it'll be brought over here like this by a train. So Oliran is clearly doing very well at uh, bringing over the iron ore at the moment. It'll go into the warehouses and then to be passed through here and that where it can then be turned into matter. So essentially, this is a, a, a fairly complicated way of saying if we have oodles and oodles of stone or iron ore that have been brought over from the planets where those are being delivered from, 
then we'll turn some of the excess into matter just to make sure that we've actually got enough of it. However, if we fill up on matter, we won't turn all of that into landfill because there's no point. Uh, and also it won't it won't affect the uh, turning any excess that we have up here into landfill. So it's another sort of it's another place that's not so much an overflow valve, but a place where we will to grab from if we have an excess available or if we have a if we have a surplus available rather than an excess. And as you can see, yes, bring over stone as well. So we're going to be passing this through and this should help keep our supplies of matter available because as you saw earlier in the video, we, when we turn the Stargate on, we get through a horrendous amount of it. And so having this system available to, uh, to keep it topped up is going to be very, very useful. This is achieved by having an extra transmitter up here in uh, where the spaceships land that monitors how much is in the warehouse here and sends it down to the ground. And then we're looking at that signal to decide whether to bring more over and to process it. Uh, notably, Tristan points out that this 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 transmitter is powered by the uh, by the pylon on the ship. So when the ship lands, it will turn that transmitter on. So if the ship isn't there, we won't be using it. And that's the and the idea behind that is to make is to make sure that this is only used when we actually have loads and loads and, and plentiful supplies available. So when the ship leaves to go and get some more, it'll be turned off at least for a little while. And this is on the should we make matter signal, which presumably comes down to here. Yes, it does. And then from there, we're, we're monitoring what's coming through. So if we, we're monitoring saying, if there's more than 50,000 iron ore up there, then we'll output an L and that'll go to the iron station. If there's more than 50,000 stone, we'll send it to the stone station. And the same for copper, for if and when we ever go to a copper planet, which we haven't yet. And then so that unloads the iron ore in this case into here, which then passes out along this belt. And I notice there's another signal along here. That's telling it to only pass the iron ore through when there's none uh, lying in this strong box here. So in, so we will still be using up the iron ore that's coming out of the uh, the core processing and the uh, and the trash system first. However, when that runs out, which it probably will at some point, we can then pass through some more iron ore from here just to keep this machine running all of the time. Over here we seem to have the opposite problem, we have so much stone coming through that this machine isn't capable of turning it into matter as quickly as it's coming in. Uh, so this box is... oh this box isn't full. Oh I see, we have, a, um, we have the same sort of thing on this one. Is that coming from... ah, that's coming from over here, I miss, I miss saw where that belt, belt was coming from, I thought that was the one from above, but no. No, this is the same sort of system coming from over here. So you can see that's passing little bursts through, and that's enough to keep this machine down here running, turning the stone into matter. So, yeah, there we go. In theory, this will mean we never run out of matter because we've got huge amounts of stone and iron ore being brought over from um, Andragon and Oliran, and that should give us plenty to keep this system running. And so, now we get on to the researches. What have we been up to in the last stream? Well, we uh, finished, finally finished off Mining Productivity 12, because that took 31,000 uh, research attempts, or whatever we want to call this. So, use 31,000 uh, science packs uh, divided by the uh, productivity, of course. So, uh, uh, quite a lot less than that, but still an awful lot. And that was using the Bio4s, as you can see there, and that's why that was a fairly difficult one. We then moved on to further long range star mappings and apparently we finished number 20 and we started number 21. And now this is showing, oh, and this is showing number 22. So I guess 21 finished while I, while I was making the video. But we did number 20 and 21 is technically not actually finished yet. So uh, we'll gloss over that a little bit. <laughs> and then I guess we'll be doing 22 next, presumably. We've also unlocked advanced rare metal conversion. So this is turning matter into rare metal, but it also requires charged matter stabilizers. And this is why I was saying I don't think this is worthwhile. So the amount of matter that's taken to turn, uh, to, to create the rare metals is not particularly significant. However, a charged matter stabilizer requires a, a matter stabilizer because you need to charge it. Making one of those requires two quantum processors, a Naquim Tesseract, an AI core, and a basic matter stabilizer, which requires a lattice pressure vessel, magnetic canister, AI core, and, and two energy control units, and a broad matter catalog, and probably a parsnip and a pear tree. The problem with this is if you then use your charged matter stabilizer and some matter to make your rare metals, you will have a 1% chance of losing your matter stabilizer. And so at that point, because of the cost of making these things, and the fact that you'll only get it back 99% of the time, I don't think it's actually worth trying to turn matter back into stuff. Not even rare metal, which is probably going to be one of the cheaper ones. Uh, presumably making something like Holmenite, that requires 10 times as much matter, but it still only has a 1% chance of destroying the stabilizer, so that's not too bad. Can you even make Naquium? No, probably not. So because of the cost of making these, charged, these matter stabilizers, and, and therefore the charged ones as well, I don't think it's worth doing, the, doing this. The, the cost in matter is fairly insignificant. You've seen how much we've got flooding in here. It could be quite nice to turn this into some of the more difficult to obtain um, uh, exotic metals. However, because you're going to rip through huge quantities of quantum processors, Naquium tesseracts, and lattice pressure vessels and, and broad matter catalogs. And these things are expensive because there's all of these data cards going into it and all of these require 
quite a lot of stuff and force field and so on and so on, all the way up the tree, these are enormously expensive. So I don't think that making a quantity of rare metals or even iridium for the price of one of these charged matter stabilizers is remotely worth it, uh, especially as you only get 10 of it out on the other side. So no, I don't think we're going to be doing that. However, in the interest of completion, we're still doing the researches. Uh, there's a few of them left. Yes, okay, so we've got the beryl, the holmenite, the irid iridite and the uh, vulcanite ones left to do. So we'll do them for the sake of completeness, but I'd be quite surprised if we ever actually use any of those recipes, except perhaps out of, you know, curiosity. On a similar topic, we also did the cryonite conversion. That's the same sort of thing. You can convert cryonite into matter and you can convert matter into cryonite. We're not, as I say, I don't think we're going to be doing any of that. We have, however, developed antimatter ammo, and that sounds quite exciting. We can now make antimatter turret rockets, artillery shells, rockets, railgun shells, weapon delivery capsules, and also a targeting remote for it. Uh, all of those things, they sound a lot of fun. However, we're, we're kind of post-combat at this point. So with the possible exception of going into a pyramid and firing one of those off just to see what it does, I can't see us really using any of this, at least not very much. We've researched it. We'll probably make a, uh, a couple of antimatter rockets and, and fire them out of a rocket launcher inside a pyramid just to, you know, to see what happens because they're just probably going to create a cool bang. But again, we're, we're, we've, we've solved combat now. We, we have plague rockets. We have massively powerful lasers. We have personal laser defences that can kill any, any biter we ever encounter in seconds. Uh, we don't need any of these more, more powerful weapons than what we've got at the moment, especially not when you actually have to pay for the ammunition for them. So I think Unfortunately, K2 has rather unbalanced the uh, the combat in this game uh, because it's given you so many toys that just make everything so easy that combat has been has been trivialised. Perhaps in hindsight, we should have installed a mod that would give us stronger and stronger biters. And perhaps I don't know. Maybe, maybe there's some plague resistant biters uh, out there in a mod somewhere. I don't know. I, I, but then, or maybe the plague rocket should be more expensive or more difficult. I, I don't know. Balancing this sort of thing is an incredibly difficult challenge. I just don't feel it is quite balanced for a couple of reasons. First because the biters are no longer a challenge. And now that's okay. It's okay for something to become trivialised in late game. I mean, that's the case with, with, with say, cliffs or lakes. Uh, by late game, you have so much uh, cliff explosive and uh, landfill that you don't need to worry about them anymore and the bots will deal with them for you. However, because we're still unlocking new weapons, it means these are now sort of fairly pointless and therefore we almost need a tougher challenge to go in and use some of these weapons against. So whilst I don't mind the, the uh, challenge of the biters being essentially removed by getting to late game stages, I feel that if we're still getting new weapons at that point, then they're just not going to be used. So the game is not balanced around those weapons rather than around the challenge of the biters. Does that make sense? Let me know what you think in the comments. And that brings us to the end of the list. As I said, we're working on uh, Long Range Star Mapping 21, ignore the number up here in the top corner, and uh, we'll have that finished some point during the next stream. As you've probably noticed, I'm taking some time off at the moment because it's uh, show week, and so things are uh, a little hectic for me, and I'm just straight up, I'm not around to do any streaming, so sorry about that, I just uh, I can't make it. However, streams will resume as normal on the 20th of May, which is next Monday. Uh, we'll be carrying on with all of the normal sort of Factorio K2SE stuff, and then I'll be back on the 22nd of the Wednesday just after with some more Satisfactory. And things are going quite well. I'm actually, I'm actually at the point where I'm, I'm keen to play more Satisfactory, because even though I'm finding the rail stuff a little bit frustrating when I'm trying to when I'm trying to build rails, uh, so the system just isn't very good. Um, despite that, I'm still enjoying the game, and I'm keen to get in and carry on building some of the new factories that I'm, I'm working on at the moment. As well as that, there will of course be the update videos at the end of the week as well, talking about the uh, the next stream. So make sure you subscribe to the channel, please, so you don't miss out on any of that. And I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.